Thank you, everyone. So, uh, just a quick bit, quick bit about me. I've been doing software for since the Stone Ages. Uh, I do a lot of application security. Last 12 years at an application security company, so I know the space very well. I've done the transformation, so I started with Waterfall, and I've done transformations to Agile and to DevOps. Uh, I'm a whiskey tourist, so I spend a lot of time when I go to a different country or a different state to find out what their local whiskeys are. So if you've got some in Connecticut that you really love, I'd love to hear about it. All right, so application risk. Uh, we suck at this. And if you talk to a security person, they think that we do it on purpose, that we're just idiots. Fact is that we were never trained. So I went to school at WPI, not too far from here. There were no security courses. Does, is anyone in the room have like a formal CS degree? Okay, couple. And did any of you get application security training? One, all right, that's interesting. So besides the college problem of not having those courses, there are a lot of people that came to software development that weren't trained as software engineers, electrical engineering, civil engineering, people that in high school just picked up Python and said, hey, this is awesome, let me do this. So there's this training gap where we do things the way we were trained. So when I took a database course, it's like, hey, we put all these strings together, we throw it at the database, and we get back results. If it's the right results, then great. And if not, then you know, we go through and debug. But that's the way we were taught to code. The fact is that we've spent billions of dollars on securing our infrastructure. We have uh, firewalls. We've got intrusion detection and prevention. We've got endpoint protection. The one thing that we haven't done a good job at is application security. By the way, these applications are meant to take sensitive data in and out. So for instance, travelers. There is sensitive data that they hold on to on behalf of their customers that comes in and out of that interface. So how do you know whether what's happening in that transaction is the right stuff or the wrong stuff? So WAFs don't do a very good job at this, and they just guess. So we don't really use them in practice. And this is the path of least resistance for hackers today. So they use our applications against us. It's not necessarily applications that we build. It could be applications that we buy, and it could be also applications that are open source and free, free like uh, a puppy, not like a lunch, that we put on our, uh, on our networks. Uh, who here was part of the Equifax breach, had their data exposed? Should be about half the room. This is, uh, so I heard, about, I heard someone talking about open source today and yesterday as well, here's the problem. We become targets of opportunity when we don't take good care of our open source. Again, it's free like a puppy, not like a lunch. And there are requirements and things that you need to think about when doing that. I have other talks on this. I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. But the fact is that attackers use our own IoT. So who has a, an internet uh, camera, IP camera sitting on their fridge watching, you know, watching the house? They take control of those because they're built on open source, it's insecure, has hard-coded passwords. They put their own software on it, and then they go and attack the internet. So uh, the DNS attack last year, the DDoS attack, where you couldn't get to half the internet, that was our IP cameras at work. So we give them the compute for free for them to go and attack us. So again, you become targets of opportunity if you don't do a good job of managing your open source. Uh, who here? So I. I peeked around the curtain, who here has an application security program? I know Travelers does. Okay, Who's here to learn about application security? Excellent. So for, for a lot of you in this room that didn't raise your hands, that's what you have. And even for companies that do a very good job at application security, they don't cover everything. And that's a problem. So there's at least part of their inventory that looks like this. Now, Oftentimes, if you have this very rigid structure, and we talked about this with travelers yesterday, it could look like this. There's a gate. I got this gate. I got to you know, traverse the gate. Uh, and you see the security team like this if you're in the application development space. right? Standing on the bridge, sorry, you can't go to production. You suck. Here's all your problems. And there are really two outcomes that you see when you put these gates in place. Uh, a lot of times, I see this one where yeah, there's really a gate, but I, you know, I found a way around it. Uh, it's either you call your boss or you just avoid the process altogether. 
Uh, worst case, when a company gets really good at governance is it looks like this, which is amusing, but not really good for the business. Right, so we find all this risk late, we crash headlong into the gate and like, crap, I thought that wasn't gonna be there. So I wanna talk briefly about how we got to DevOps because I think it's really important to understand this as we talk about application security or shifting anything left. And a great talk before about you know, shifting your sustaining left. So if we start with waterfall, and this is the way the companies were typically structured. You had a VP in charge of each of those silos. They had a, a set of team members on there that were specialized to that. And you had these handoffs in between. And if you've ever played telephone, you know that whatever starts at the front never makes it to the back. So by the time it gets to the poor operations folks, they don't know why it was written, who it was written for, what it's supposed to do, how it's supposed to operate, which brings in our devs here. Because we do design up front, but then when we get there, we're like, oh crap, I didn't know it was gonna work like that. Or I didn't expect this, or I didn't see that coming. So we have to make adjustments along the way. The design never comes out the way we architected it. It just, it, we make changes. And those changes don't get propagated down the line. Similarly, we never get feedback. And this is critical for Agile and DevOps. We never hear about the dumpster fires that we leave on Ops doorstep. It's not our problem, who cares? So when we went to Agile, the, the typical first step in an Agile transformation is we knock down the first couple walls, we put the, the developers and testing and the product owner in a room, we say, there is no credit until it's tested and functional. Right, in the old days, in Waterfall, it was pencils down, man, I'm done writing code, and now it's somebody else's problem to go test it. Now, I have to think about maybe test-driven development, or I have to make sure I'm working with my partners in quality to, to make sure that it functions by the end of the sprint, or else we don't get the, the velocity of that story until we finish that testing. So there isn't a developer on the planet now that doesn't walk into a company that doesn't expect that their code has to work, but that's the way it worked before. We still have these same problems, they're less so, but still down to operations and security with that same backflow channel of feedback that we're not getting. So we said, all right, well, let's knock down all the walls. So let's put everyone in the room that has to deal and think about the software, the writing, the operating, so that when I'm talking about a new feature, someone with an operational mindset could say, hey, you know what? Last time we did something like this, here's how we took down production. Security can say, hey, here are the things that we need to think about as we build this to make sure that we're gonna pass our security tests. Here's our threats. So this is the world that we live in today, or at least that we want to, for those of you that still are on that journey. So does anyone wanna hazard a guess? The goal of an application security program, there's usually somebody in the audience that wants to volunteer. Anyone brave? I'll take any answer. Make applications secure, I love that. Anyone else? Reduce risk, love that too. Anybody else? I'm sorry? Make it so no one can use it. Make it so no one can use it. Well, all right, yeah, that is secure. <laughs> Air gap it. Uh, oftentimes there's also reputa brand reputation damage risk assessment, you know, understanding my risks, and those are all good things, but I believe that they are the outcome, not the goal. So I believe that if you have the right goal in mind that you get a better outcome as a result. So all the things that people said are actually in fact what you get. So let's talk about cost to fix. And this one's well known. If you are a software developer, quality or whatever, if you've ever built software, you know it's cheaper to do it when you wrote it than it is when you release it. So that's a very easy thing to navigate. And that's true of any bug because it's not just uh, the cost to fix that one thing because that cost might be pretty fixed. It's all the decisions that were made on top of that and after that, all the testing that happened as, after that that now has to get redone. It's like uh, knitting a sweater. If you knit a sweater and, and drop a stitch in the first couple rows and you get all the way to the end, guess what? I gotta undo all that work and then redo it all. And chances are I'm not gonna do it perfectly the second time either. So if we think about this in the physical sense, uh, of this jet engine here. So here's this jet engine. I've got a pallet of parts over here, thousands of parts, and here's my workforce. We're gonna put this thing together. It's gonna take us thousands of hours as well of, of, of people power to put this together. We're gonna do it, we'll put it out in the parking lot, we'll put some gas in it and see what happens. 
Now, chances are it's going to blow up. And maybe one of the reasons is, you know, one of the fins in that assembly over there on the left had a microfracture in it that you couldn't see with the naked eye, but it was there. Right? So when it came up to speed, it flew apart and destroyed the whole thing. So all the value that you created is now gone. Now, let's say I could rewind and say, all right, now we know. It's out in the parking lot, and someone says, hey, I know there's a broken fin in there. So what does it cost to disassemble this thing and put it back together, to find that one fin, take it out, put a new one in? What if we looked at the parts that were sitting over here in the pallet and we x-rayed them? Or even better, shifted even further left and said, hey, supplier, you have to quality inspect all these parts. I want them x-rayed. I want to know that they're good before I put them in. So this is the thought about shifting security left, shifting quality left. This is what Toyota, the Toyota production system is all about, is finding the earliest place that you could do that and make sure that you stop there if there's something wrong. So I don't have to go through this. Usually I'm doing this in front of a security crowd and I have to explain Agile to them. Does, it, does anyone want that explanation? I'm happy to do it. Okay. So here's our scrum team doing their good work. And this is security. I'm at the wind. What? The, I, I don't understand what's going on in that room. No one invites me to these meetings. All I get is something out the mail slot that said, here's our release. What do you think? <coughs> so when that release comes, they look at it, they scan it, found 100 things. So they're all laughing in their little security room going, 100 things, yeah, right. All right, let's, let's talk about this. Okay, here's 20 things that we really, really have to have fixed for the business. Off to the scrum master and the product owner. Hey, guys, here's a list of things that we need to have fixed. It's 20 things. 20? I don't have time for that. i got to release the product. Uh, my VP that owns the P&L has said that we, we've got to get this thing out. We've got sales hanging on this, whatever the case may be. So what ends up happening is maybe you get five, maybe you get one, maybe you get none. The rest fall in the backlog. I end up fighting for budget, which is a terrible, terrible thing to do for the business. So there needs to be a better way. Now, the cost of writing software is not just the writing part. Right? So I'm a developer. I write bugs. At some rate, it's impossible to avoid. So here I am developing. And then I have to find the thing that, that I broke. Then we got to talk about it. Now, this is a triage meeting. So it's the product owner. It's the, uh, the scrum master. It's the entire team. So it's expensive time-wise and money-wise, to for us to sit in a meeting to talk about the things that went wrong. Work on those, say, who's going to fix it? So hopefully, it's the same person that wrote it because that's the path of least resistance. Otherwise, go back to the sustaining talk. Someone else has to read the code, figure out what they meant to do, and fix it right. So then we have to retest. So this is actually the cost of writing code. It's not just writing the code. It's all the things that happen after that. Now, I'll tell you from a security point of view, it is possible, go back to the database example I gave. If you take strings and concatenate them together, you can put that through a database engine and it will do the right thing. And that's the way we were taught and that's the way we do it. Now, if I told you, hey, use parameterized queries, it doesn't cost you any more to do that than to write the string concats. And it's not susceptible to SQL injection, which is a really, really bad thing. So what if I taught you that and said, hey, here's this fork in the road. You have a choice now. Do it the way you've always done it, or do it this new way. And the new way isn't any harder, and it's fr frankly more readable. So let's do that. Now, if I could sit that developer down with that knowledge, specifically for security, because quality is a different issue. These, these kind of bugs are, are harder to prevent. But for these, these are choices. Now I sit down and I develop, and then I keep developing. I never create one of those. So back to my initial question. What do you think I think should be the goal of your application security program? Well, OK, how? How? OK, yes, but more. Uh, yes, but what if I just trained the developers? What if I had developers that knew how to write secure code? What if it comes out of here secure? Because for a large part of the OWASP top 10, if you don't know what that is, I'd be happy to explain it to you, it can come out of here secure. 
I just make that choice. When I get to that fork in the road and say it's time for, to write a SQL query, it's like, well, I'm not going to do it the old way because I know I'm going to get dragged in front of security for this. So if we teach developers how to do it right, then they do it faster. All right, so other people have given their spiel on what they think a DevOps team is. I've gotten to see uh, hundreds of companies from the inside and talk about their practices, and this is typically what I see. They talk about DevOps as the people that write automation, my DevOps team, my DevOps person, whatever. And really, it's the write it, you write it, you run it. It has to be a cross. I have to own everything. So go back to that previous picture where I had security and operations in the room working on the software, building the software with me. Similarly with security, we find them here, but it really needs to be everywhere, per the comment before. We have to include it everywhere. Security is everyone's job. It's important to think about it beforehand because I don't want to make mistakes that I'm going to have to go undo. Unplanned work is horrible in Agile, but especially in DevOps. If I can get to the point in my DevOps process where I can take one person's work, check it into source code, and it goes all the way to production without any human hands touching it, touchdown. But if I'm making security flaws as a part of that, I have to go back and redo that work, then I've just introduced a brick wall into that process. All right, so here's the strategy. All right, it's going to be a little tongue in cheek. Who has read the Phoenix Project? Excellent. For those that haven't, it's a, a story, not a textbook. It's a very easy read. It will help you understand these things at a deeper level. Now, in that book, you were introduced to the three ways of DevOps. And I've taken that and said, all right, well, what would it look like if we said the three ways of DevSecOps? If I put security in there, if security is important. Now, for some of you, security is not important to your company. OK, fine. That's fine. But for the rest of you, especially highly regulated industries like travelers, uh, finance, retail, um, healthcare, these are important things to take into account. So let's think about how to do it properly. So the first one is all about relationships. So the, what they talk about now is called flow. It's systems thinking when the book came out. But if you listen to the audio series uh, Beyond the Phoenix Project, they're now calling this flow. What are the set of steps and things I need to do to go from idea to customer? First of those is relationships. It's very easy for me to look at the security person and say, us versus them. I don't know them. Security's in my way. Security looks at us and say, they're a bunch of idiots. They're doing it wrong all the time. But if I start to have conversations with them in the same way that we had conversations in Agile. So we got to release software so fast that it overwhelmed our operations teams. They're like, holy crap, I cannot deal with this level of change. We were paying developers and development teams to change software quickly. And we were paying operations to make it glassy smooth. But you can't walk up to a lake, drop a pebble in it, and not have it cause a ripple. So change is part of it. But those goals are misaligned. So what you end up with is this, right? People tugging in opposite directions that you're actually paying to do that. Why, why do we want to do this? These goals came from those silos down to those people say, here's the thing that I care about the most, and not here's what the business needs. So we need to have those goal realignment discussions to say, hey, it's not possible it will be 100% secure. It's not possible to make things glassy smooth. How do we deal with this in the meantime? How do we align our goals such that we're both getting paid to do something that's useful for, uh, for our, our company? Which brings us to mutual accountability. Now, this is all about, at the highest levels of your company, saying, CIO, CISO, we care about security. We're going to report regularly to our CEO. I'm going to give them a, an accounting transparently on how we're doing. Not as a stick to beat us up with, but to show us where we have gaps. Once you get that to happen, so think of this as a pyramid in the company, right? CEO at the top, here's my CIO and CISO. I can have that discussion there very easily. If I try to do it across thousands of people, wicked hard. And yet, that's the way we do application security today. We go into those teams and try to cajole them and, and get them to come along instead of saying, let's get accountability built into our goals. You, you do what you're paid to do. If your bonus is tied to how fast you ship software, then that's what you concentrate on. So you have to have that sense of, it's, it's my fault. If it's broken, I'll fix it. If it's not secure, I'll fix it. If it breaks in production, I'll fix it. It's that level of accountability. It's, uh, so I've heard this in two different negative ways. One, I was at a B-Sides conference, actually, uh, 
in Connecticut, uh, where one of the leaders of OWASP, so that's the Open Web Application Security Project, got up in front of a crowd of security people and said, we're going to hold the developers accountable. I mean, race fists and everything. There might have been a crowd with pitchforks behind them. So I get to speak after him. It's like, well, you know, how do you think developers feel about you talking to them like that? I had a CISO that I was having a discussion with and said, hey, we're going to enforce security in the pipeline. I'm like, hmm, OK, I understand what you're trying to do, but what if we shift the conversation around? What if we told, what if the developer said, I want to be accountable? What if they embrace security instead of you enforcing it on them? That feels different to me. That feels like we're going to make progress. So that's what this is all about getting that mutual accountability for whatever is important to your business. All right, second way, feedback loops are essential. Here's the thing, though. We suck as people in giving feedback and getting feedback. Holy crap. We do it at the wrong time with the wrong words. There isn't a, a culture in the company that kind of fosters this. So you come out, you're heated, and you just want to let loose on somebody. That sucked. That was terrible. You didn't meet my expectations. You broke it again. If we don't learn how to do this well, and by the way, we get feedback all the time from our systems too. So computers and software give us feedback to tell us we're not doing the job well enough. So the first is I need to have a culture where I want to learn and that when a, an employee comes to me to talk to me and give me feedback, I presume positive intent. They're not here to ruin my day. They're not here to you know, crap on my desk. They're here to help me be a better engineer, which I want to be. I want to be the best me I can. I can't do that if I don't know things are broken. So you know, simple things like asking, hey, would you be OK with me giving you some feedback on that presentation you gave yesterday? Now, the answer might be, she's really agitated right now. Yes, but not right now. OK, fine. So we'll rewind. We'll come back, and we'll, we'll do that together when you're in the right state of mind. And it's not, you know, it, it needs to be a, a mix of positive and negative feedback, uh, but it needs to be constructive. We can't do this stuff without measurement, whether it's performance or resource utilization, uh, security. I need to measure. So if I went to the doctor once a year, only once a year, to get my blood pressure taken, and they say, you got to have high blood pressure today. What do they know about my blood pressure? It's high today. What was it yesterday? What's it going to be tomorrow? What's the trend? Is it getting worse? Is it getting better? I mean, should they send me to the hospital now? If I change the measurement from yearly to monthly to weekly to maybe even daily, now what do I know? Well, I had an omelet this morning with some home fries and poured a bunch of salt on it, and my blood pressure went up. Hey, maybe I should cut down on the salt. You can start to see cause and effect. You can start to see do better, do worse. Uh, a lot of times, uh, companies will say, hey, we've got a training program. Awesome. Does it work? I don't know. Because they didn't measure before, and they didn't measure afterwards, so they put all this money and time into this training, and God knows if it did anything, because they weren't actually looking at the needles. Because we're untrained, because the workforce is untrained, you can't go hire people to do this. You have to train them. So your company has to take the responsibility to say, we are going to train you. And by the way, if I have mutual accountability, those discussions become easy. And sometimes it's pull and not push. Sometimes I'm going to go to the security people, hey, we got this rash of SQL injection errors, and I don't understand them. Can you come to our meeting and give us a, a lunch on this? Which is another tip. So tell this to the security people, because I tell this to them for you. Fill a room with pizzas and then it will fill with developers, because we love free pizza. Feed them. Do it, do it over our lunch break when we're not like, engrossed with something else. They also need to understand. They have to understand how the sausage is made. Now, that's our job to help them understand that. Now, we can point them at resources like the Phoenix Project, the DevOps Handbook, but they have to take that, because it's possible to give help that hurts. We want help that helps. And by the way, we don't want to be overtrained. So if we go back to, to this one here, don't give me a four hour training course on secure Java coding. Because back to the first talk today, in the old days, when I had to learn a new technology, I went to Barnes and Noble, I bought this book that was like this thick, paid 70 bucks for it, and I used this much of it. 
but I had to go through the process of weeding out what wasn't important to find the things that I needed out of that book. So let's do that. Let's micro-train. You guys are having a problem with something because I'm measuring, so I'm going to give you the help that you need now for the things that are bothering you today. And then we can rinse and repeat that over time. Integration, automation, keys to DevOps. Uh, we need to shift things left such that our definition of done now includes security scanning in our IDE, on our desktop, before we put our pencils down. Done should be done and not kind of done and almost done and, you know, scrum waterfall-ish, agile thing. I want to have a definition done that is clear and concise, that I understand, that says, hey, this is an open book test, by the way. Whatever tests I'm running here is what I run in my assurance test after, in my CI process. After I check in, those should be the same exact tests. How many people have gone on a Friday in a hurry, wife's calling, hey, we're going out to dinner, we're going out with friends, you gotta get home. It's like, I gotta get this code change checked in. And you hit the button and you run out the door. Only to find that you broke the build. Because we didn't take the time to run the test because the tests take too long, and I, I just gotta go and I gotta get this work checked in. Those things can't happen anymore. We have to have good discipline around this to say, when I check it in, it means I'm done and I've run all the tests because if I find something in my assurance and my CI process, it means that I didn't follow the process. So I can, my manager or my scrum master can now invite me back into the process and remind me why we do it. Helping us fix what we find, also critical. So again, we're untrained, so we see something new. I need to have someone to pick it up pick up the phone and ask a question. So security should be providing that to us. So the third way, experimentation and learning. This is critical here. Super important that we try new things. Now one of them is, oftentimes you need someone to come in from the outside. Now it could be someone in a different group of your company, or it could be a consultant that comes in and looks at the process and say, why are you doing that? That does not make any sense anymore. We have to take a, look, a step back Look at these processes that were in place for a long time. We do them because we do them, because we've always done them. But that doesn't mean it's a good idea anymore. So let's, let's look at that and experiment with those things. And this has been spoken about several times too. Failure has to be okay. It has to be all right for us to screw up. That's where we learn. There was a, a doctor at a, a DevOps Enterprise Summit that said, good outcomes come from experience. Experience comes from bad outcomes. We learn more from our mistakes than we do from our successes, and let's not hide it. Share the learning. You're probably not the only one that's going to stumble over in, in this way. So don't be ashamed of it. Embrace it. I learned something new today. You know, in the, in the Toyota production system, if they went from 100 and in cord pulls to 50, in America they'd say, yes, we're twice as good. And in Japan they would say, we learned half as much. So they tighten tolerances to make those failures happen again so we can start learning again. Don't be afraid of learning. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. And again, this needs to be baked into your culture. It can't be a witch hunt. It needs to be a learning opportunity. The last one is security champions. <clears throat> so this is something where there are a small number of security people and a ton of developers. It's usually like one to 250, 300, 500 people that they're trying to support. Can't do that. There's too many meetings. Uh, if, if you talk about Agile, uh, there's too many opportunities where they're talking about the software that they're writing, where security could be part of that conversation. So what do we do? Where can we find people that are in all these meetings? This is where we cross-train. We get at least one. I prefer two, because bus factors of one suck. I get two people. I train them up on the simple stuff to start with, build them over time. Guess what? You become a more uh, you become a more uh, valuable developer to me, and you become more valuable afterwards. So it gives me that lever into the organization that now I'm getting all this feedback about all the things that are happening, and I can stay on top of it. I can be strategic while they're being tactical. So critical to build something like this in very large organizations. And with that, I thank you for your time. <laughs>